Since 1994, Dr. John Tomzig has been a leading expert in high-energy astrophysics, studying the most extreme phenomena of our universe. He has worked at several notable universities, and he is now a research scientist at UC Berkeley. John has helped design and develop several X-ray satellites, for example, the NUSTOR Spectroscopic Telescope Array, or NUSTOR. He joins us today as the leader of the Compton Spectrometer and Imager mission, or COSI for short. This is a new gamma ray mission recently approved for funding by NASA. COSI will unveil some of the hidden mysteries of our universe in the MEV energy band. Let's find out more from the principal investigator himself. John, thank you very much for being with us today for this interview. To get started, why don't you tell us about your research interests and a bit of maybe about the path that led you to your research field? My, my main um, work has been on uh, galactic compact objects. So this is black holes and neutron stars and white dwarfs. Um, they produce X-ray emission um, because of the accretion of matter onto the compact objects. And I've probably mostly been most most been involved in in the creating black hole work. Really, I was kind of a general physicist until I uh, went into grad school, and then I selected astrophysics as my my thesis topic. Got into instrumentation, started working on data from satellites. You're more of a high energy astrophysicist, so you look at things from X rays and then gamma rays. But why are uh, these so important to study these high energetic photons? So X rays and gamma rays, uh, you know, allow us to study extreme, uh, you know, places in the universe. They are places where there's extreme particle acceleration that's producing non-thermal emission. We see that in accreting black holes, but then we, al we also see it from many other uh, sources in the universe. Gamma ray bursts, um, blazars, which are the supermassive black holes, have strong uh, gamma ray emission. We were all very excited when we heard uh, that NASA actually uh, approved uh, the Compton Spectrometer and Imager, also known as COSI, for being built and launched soon enough. COSI is it's a satellite, right? So it's going to be launched on a mm. space rocket and put in a sort, certain orbit around the Earth, right? And you are the leader of the mission, the principal investigator. So can you tell us a bit more about this mission? So it's in, it's in low Earth orbit, and it's also in what's known as an equatorial orbit, which means that it's pretty close to the equator. And the reason we do that is because when you go to higher inclination orbits, you have much higher background because they're high energy particles, kind of the same ones that produce the aurora, uh, you know, will also produce background in, in our instrument. So it operates in the MEV band pass, which is mm -hmm. a part of the spectrum that has not been very, very well studied before. The way COSI works is it actually has a, a very large field of view. So it sees a quarter of the sky at one time. Um, it's always looking away from Earth, and so as it orbits around Earth, it covers the whole sky, uh, but we look at the northern sky for 12 hours and then look at the southern sky for, for 12 hours, and so in that way we get the whole sky every day. So that's, that's one part of what we're doing is just exploring this, you know, unexplored band pass and covering the whole sky so we'll find out what's, what's there. So there's a big discovery aspect to COSI. But then the other thing is it has germanium detectors, which is how you get the best energy resolution um, for pretty much any, any kind of detector. One really important thing about observing in that bandpass is that there are nuclear lines from certain elements. So when supernova events occur, they produce uh, radioactive elements that decay and produce lines that are specifically in that, in that part of the uh, energy spectrum. And uh, with the good energy resolution, that's how you can measure these nuclear lines. And what are these lines telling us about these big explosions? Some of them have uh, short half-lives and they tell us about what happened right after the supernova explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nickel 56, there's titanium 44. So that tells us specifically about what happened in the explosion. Cozy also studies aluminum 26 and iron 60, which have much longer half-lives. So they tell us about where element formation occurred you know, across the whole galaxy. What we'll do there is combine um, the wide field of view, which will cover you know, the entire galaxy with, these, with the, the good energy resolution. And so we'll make maps of the elements that I mentioned before. What are the biggest technical challenges of a mission like Cozy? 
and what are the innovations that you had to develop in order for covering these energy bands? One good thing is that we've flown this instrument on balloons several times. So, you know, when, we, when you ask about new technology, some of this technology, it's the first time it'll be on a satellite, but we've used it on balloons quite a bit. We've flown four times, first time in 2005, uh, and then the last time in 2016. The 2016 flight, um, we had a, a really good flight. We had a 46 day um, flight um, from New Zealand, actually. And so the balloon actually went around the earth, uh, you know, one and a half times uh, and then landed in Peru. So it's kind of translating from that experiment to, to the satellite. But the, the germanium detectors that I mentioned are, are pretty special. Um, they are called double-sided strip detectors. And so, um, you know, basically they're, they're, they're planar detectors and they, and you can measure three-dimensional positions uh, with the detectors with excellent energy resolution is something we'll get with these detectors. And they're, they're probably the biggest technological advance. How did you end up leading the mission? You know, I mentioned getting started working on instrumentation and uh, and especially X-ray detectors. Um, you know, so that was for my PhD, and then I just continued to work on uh, mostly data from different different missions. And you know, when I when I came to Berkeley, that's when I started getting involved in COSI. So that was 2006. I I was the project scientist for several years. Um, so kind of. Um, started to lead the group. And then there was this proposal opportunity, just continued work in high energy astrophysics and <laughs> taking, <laughs> that taking, op great. taking opportunities when they arose. How big is the team that you're leading? Because I suppose with this kind of mission, you need different, different expertise. So if you can tell us about which kind of like people you look for when you are building or thinking about a mission concept. Let's see the email that I sent out after we heard we were selected had had 55 people on it. <laughs> those, were kind of, those were the people that were involved in the, in the concept study report. This is managers and finance people to do the budget, um, of course, scientists to write the science uh, case, engineers to prove some of the um, technology. And yeah, so just a wide, wide range of different uh, people that we need to put that together. And, uh, yeah, you know, and now we're adding to the team even more. So there'll be, you know, well over a hundred people, you know, involved. <laughs> so it's been like more than 15 years that of this planning and all of a sudden now finally it's been accepted. So what are usually the steps that it takes for from point zero, which is I think about this new mission to actually getting it accepted? Flights were very important. So definitely that 2016 flight. The step one proposal we wrote in 2019. At that point, you know, we need to design the instrument and do simulations. This is another really important thing is we had the data from the balloon, got some results from the balloon, mm -hmm. uh, but we had to do simulations to say, so if this was actually on a satellite, we would do, you know, this much better. And the results show that we would do a lot better on the satellite. So that helped a lot. The steps are getting that machinery in place. Then you can write your science case. Uh, you know, then you kind of have to figure out what are the requirements for the mission? You know, what do we need to design to do the measurements? So that's all part of the step one, one process. Then we, we heard we were selected for phase A, a planning phase. But now you have to do a real design of the instrument, you know, with all the details and even down to like every screw that you're going to put on the satellite. How much does it weigh? Can we actually launch this for, you know, the kind of launcher that's available? And how much power is it going to take? Can you, you know, you're going to put solar panels on there, but is that going to produce enough power? The instrument's going to heat up when you use the power. Can you get rid of the heat? So there's, that's a... That's a challenge in space that's different from the balloon. We had a, our balloon instrument, but um, you know, obviously a balloon launch is nice and nice and gra gradual and, and smooth. Mm -hmm. And a rocket launch is going to be much bumpier. You know, we had to redesign how our detectors are held to, you know, to make sure that they wouldn't break. Uh, well, hopefully they won't break. <laughs> <laughs> So like we have like a vibration table here at SSL where we, we actually built a, you know, a model of the detector holder and put detectors in it and then shook it like to, <laughs> you know, to launch, to launch uh, levels and showed that nothing broke. So. And so now, so you went to the phase A and then I suppose after that you got, this is now when it was selected. Technically we're still in phase A and <laughs> we have to get to E before we launch. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, you're, you're not done yet. <laughs> so B is going to be a one-year um, 
development phase where we make what we call engineering models. Well, so we already built like the detector holder, but we're going to have to build a real version of the electronics, for example, like with the boards that are the right size for the instrument, things like that. It's a one-year phase and uh, it ends in what's called the, the preliminary design review where we have to present, um, you know, and kind of convince a, a, a committee that everything's going to work. And then we go to phase C and C and D, and then we're actually starting to make the flight hardware, you know, that will actually go in space. Um, and then end of D is the launch, and that's planned for 2025. Uh, and then, well, then we'll observe as long as we can. It, we plan for everything to be a two-year mission. All of the science goals that we have, you know, we need two years of observation. You know, usually these missions last longer than that, so... It'd be nice if we could be up for a decade or something like that. Uh, how often does NASA actually launch new mission and how many people did you have to compete with when proposing this particular mission? There were 18 proposals. They had they had two classes. They had uh, small explorers and they had missions of opportunity. So the small explorers were actually the larger of the two, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the missions of opportunity are, are typically... Um, uh, what they call small sats, which are very small satellites. They selected uh, two small explorers, and COSY was one of them, and they selected two missions of opportunity. Then they selected uh, just COSY. So I guess one out of 18, if you want to count. <laughs> Not every mission that gets selected makes it to launch, but about three on average per, per uh, decade. About three astrophysics missions per decade um, make it to launch. It must have been like a huge challenge. And uh, I guess, well, you're not really done with this process. What can you say, at least so far, what has been the best part of leading this mission and what has been maybe the worst part of the whole process? Being selected and all the messages I got from really all over the world, you know, people that are in, you know interested in high energy astrophysics were really excited about the mission. And I was really happy to see um, you know, the support uh, that I had. So that, that might be the best part. There's great support, uh, you know, but you guys better not mess up. <laughs> Finally, before we conclude, can you tell us what is the thing you're excited about when COSI will launch and what it will see? A couple of things that I'm excited about is, um, you know, I, I mentioned that I, my research has largely been on accreting black holes. And Cygnus X1 is, is a persistently bright, black hole, it's going to be, you know, bright enough for COSY to make a polarization measurement um, of, of Cygnus X1. It's going to tell us a lot about where the gamma ray emission is coming from. Is it coming from a jet from the black hole or is it coming from the inner accretion disk? So I think we're going to answer that question right, right away. And then the other thing, which is actually our number one science goal, is to map the um, electron-positron annihilation emission from the whole galaxy. When electrons and positrons annihilate, they produce uh, gamma rays at 511 keV. There's a bright, strong emission from, from the uh, galactic center that COSY will get a good uh, image of for the first time um, just after a couple months of observing. It's an excess, which means that we don't understand where it's coming from. When we get that image, it might show us that it's a bunch of uh, point sources, you know, so it could be a bunch of little black holes producing uh, positrons, um, or it could be something like emission from Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole in the center, or we might see a very smooth distribution. One of the reasons that this is our number one science goal is uh, that there are some theorists that think that the 511 emission is related to dark matter. And if it was related to dark matter, you'd just see a very smooth distribution. And so if Cozy, you know, found that, uh, you know, it would be evidence in that direction. You can start answering a lot of science questions with Cozy. It's, uh, it's really amazing. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting to be interviewed. It, it was a real pleasure. <laughs> yeah, and uh, good luck with the new faces that are coming with <laughs> the COSI preparation. Yeah, thanks a lot. I enjoyed the interview and thanks for inviting me.